I'm Susie Anetta, Editor-in-Chief of Design Anthology. And in this episode of the podcast, I'm sitting down with architect Sukian Chan, founder of Singapore-based practice SCDA. Sukian, it's so great to see you again. I mean, I can't even remember actually the last time I saw you, but it's it's been quite a year. It has been. The last time we spoke, I think it was via Zoom. That's Oh, that's true. Right? Yes, the and last time I saw about, you was uh, on a television uh, screen. On a television screen. <laughs> yeah, it was indeed. So I was doing a little bit of research, as I like to do before these conversations, and I only just recently discovered that you were born and raised in Penang in a 19th century compound that's now UNESCO protected, which is quite remarkable. I never knew that that's where you grew up. Um, So I I would love to maybe have you talk a little bit about what that experience was like, your childhood, and, um, you know, I've seen photos of your current home, and it's, it's quite different stylistically and architecturally. So I'd love to sort of understand the journey from growing up in an environment like that and how you've come to be living the way that you do now and maybe some of the influences that that experience might have had on you as a person but also how it might have influenced your architecture. So uh, I was born in that compound because my maternal side, my mother was a coup. And interestingly enough, my surname is a Chan, but the progenitor of the founder was actually a Chan adopted by the Ku family. So, so I was, of course, uh, allowed to live in the compound. And these sorts of compounds, as I come to research when I was older as an architect, was set up to not only create a community of the new arrivals to Georgetown, but also sort of as a defensive community because there were plenty of gang wars and I was living in one of those row houses and in the middle of this courtyard is the family temple very gilded and very spectacular and directly opposite it was an opera stage so uh, my childhood was spent playing in a rather open but safe environment which is the courtyard with all my cousins and extended family it was an interesting and happy childhood I figured out and so how do you think that experience has shaped the way that you create architecture? Okay, uh, the houses were shop houses and residences, and they were long. Most of them were four to five meters wide and deep. And they have multiple uh, courtyards of air well. Some have two, some have four. And the particular one that I was raised, I remember clearly as a child, First of all, the whole ambience of light and darkness, right? And uh, whenever it rained, you know, and in Penang we have tropical downpours. Uh, I remember the smell of the rain, the sound of rain hitting the granite. Uh, it's very clear in my mind. The gutters had a chain that flowed down into an urn. We, I still remember clearly it had lotus and some fish. Then it overflowed into the courtyard. So it was uh, interesting. Uh, visual memory and not only that when when the rain came down the discharge took a little while so you have a momentarily a reflective pool and then it subsided so it was very experiential and I'm quite sure it had impacted my thinking and and how I was drawn to uh, phenology and design for the human experience so I'm curious to know whether you remember, you know, a particular moment in time where you realised that you wanted to be an architect, or do you think that it was maybe a slow process of realising and understanding that that's what you wanted to do? I think it was a slow process, but I definitely knew what I didn't want to do. And during that period, uh, the choices were for, for Asian families, the professional vocations, right, doctors, accountants engineers and by elimination by the fact that I really enjoyed making things 
you know, uh, I had model kits, building blocks. Sounds a bit of a cliche, but that's what I did. So I knew quite early, maybe around eight or nine, that I would want to be an architect, even though at that particular moment, my understanding of the profession wasn't fully uh, developed. Mm. But I knew I wanted to create things. It's interesting. It seems to be quite a common experience, actually. <clears throat> I think that creative people often know that they're creative very early on. Um, so you started, or you studied, sorry, at Washington University and then did postgrad at Yale. How did you end up there? What was the thought process behind those particular schools? Was there anything about them that really attracted you to their architectural programs? Re uh, remember, this was 1979. I was uh, like 17. I had only seen America in movies, <laughs> and all my cousins had gone to UK or Australia. And I said, no, I wanted to go to the United States. And I spoke to my high school counselor. We had a very small <clears throat> vocational guidance library with books, SAT, and so on. <clears throat> and those days, I just bought through all the schools. I didn't know the geography, but I knew I wanted to do architecture. And then Washington University seems like an interesting choice because they had undergraduate uh, major in architectural studies. And I looked up the demographic that had a good, diverse international population. So um, I said, I want to go there. And they gave me a scholarship. So I, I, I eventually landed in the Midwest for four years. Wow. And then, and then how did you end up at, at Yale after that? Well, if I would talk a little bit about my undergraduate, yeah. because I think it was two different parts of the education, right? The first was just um, broadening the liberal arts and, and not really doing architecture right away, but sort of design studies. And I was very influenced by a particular professor who I think is almost 100 years old today. And he's still kind of professor emeritus and uh, my youngest son doing architecture at WashU actually interacted with him on a project too. So <clears throat> this was this guy by the name of Lasley Lasky. <clears throat> yeah, he was shaven bald, dressed in a black kind of rope like, kind of like a uh, Bauhaus influence, yeah. like Oscar Scrammer or whatever. And he would talk a lot about the Bauhaus because he had went to the Bauhaus school, oh, wow. right? Because he's 100 years old. so. His education was directly with the Bauhaus masters like Mahali Naj and, and all these guys. Mm. <clears throat> so for, for one and a half years, I was in awe and uh, intimidated by this man who just would tell me to look at the qualities of corrugated cardboard or, or metal or stone. And <laughs> so one day he told us, a small group of us, to cut a piece of uh, six inch by six inch Douglas fir, fir block. And that's the kind of thing that, that you remember to carry around my backpack <clears throat> with a chisel and to shape it. And try not to make anything, but shape it to fit your hand and, and let the inherent qualities of the nuts and grains of the wood come true. So a um, whole week you carry a block. <clears throat> and then he will explain. Uh, not to fight materials, let the nature of materials come through, how do you work with the economy of means, um, things like that, or to carry a, a, a heavy construction material and try to move your body, because it's all about movement, procession, dance, architecture, graphic design. So that was very formative for me, uh, the way I practice now to do holistic design. You know, mm. and then of course after that, I had visiting professors from the UK that introduced me to some of the other architects turn of the century, Viennese architects like Joseph Hoffman, Otto Wagner, the rest of them, uh, Louis Kahn. So undergrad actually was very formative for me. Mm. Uh, okay. It gave me the base. So when I got to graduate school uh, at Yale. It was more like the advanced studio. And what, what I had contact with was uh, interesting practitioners, you know, in the likes of Paul Rudolph. People in the studio at that time was Paul Rudolph, uh, Bota, uh, 
Uh, I had a review with Philip Johnson. <clears throat> I had Robert Manchuri. So I had all these people, uh, Hamut Yan, Shiza Pelli. <clears throat> so it was a good time. The 80s, late 80s, mid 80s was a wonderful time for me to be educated. And I, what I got out of Yale was <clears throat> uh, the intensity of, uh, of conversations and debate because I had Rob Creer, for example, who was an urbanist, right? And very traditional. He worked with Leon. And then I had some really uh, Italian rationalist <clears throat> teachers and we have this debate. <clears throat> and, and, uh, and, you know, even at that time, uh, your friends were chosen on the basis of your architectural leanings, you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I somehow <clears throat> um, didn't ballot well. The studios I wanted, I didn't get. <clears throat> I ended up with uh, a lot of postmodernist studios and ended up in a classical studio as well with Thomas Gordon Smith, <clears throat> who later became the dean of uh, Notre Dame. So I then tried my hand at orthodox classical drawings, analytics, even design a classical off law office building on the side, you know? Yeah. And things, things like being in contact with these great practitioners and masters stayed with me. It wasn't so much learning how to design as listening to their stories, mm. because some of them flew in from Europe occasionally and they will have time of the weekend to go for a drink mm. um, and they tell you the perseverance that's needed mm. for them to actually make it like what bothers them for each one of them so that that was very interesting for me to have to kind of drill down and examine deep inside what I actually believed in you know yeah did you ever stay in touch with any of those professors or lecturers from undergrad or postgrad? Have you? Yes, I, uh, I, 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 I saw um, Lasky Lasky because I went back to the school and I went to his ex exhibition opening, and he claims he remembers me. <laughs> he said that he gave a car to my son. Oh. But I didn't think so. I think I like, was somebody else probably. <laughs> but I had a very nice deep conversation with this man who's almost uh, 100 years old. Oh, wow. And he's still exhibiting, right? I mean, this is the guy in the early 80s that kind of impressed me as a foreign student from Penang. Imagine that, right? Right. Telling me in my first semester at his house how to eat, how to eat a certain kind of food, especially how do you really drink espresso, no sugar? You know, at that oh, time, wow. Americans were drinking filtered coffee. Right. So you can imagine the impression this, this, this uh, guy had on me. Just not just in design, but overall. Yeah, it was almost like he was introducing you to another mm -hmm. culture, I suppose, beyond television and movies, as you said. If that's all you had seen of the US before you arrived. But right. then you also and got this European influence as well. Very much European influence as well. And yeah. recently, not that recent, maybe three years ago, in a full circle, I got to collaborate with Cesar Pelli too, uh, before he passed on. And I made a trip back to his office because I was doing the residential tower, they're doing the whole master plan mm. uh, for a project in Japan, the, the, the Mori building project. <clears throat> so, but he was very warm and looked at me as a protege and we took photographs, had lunch. It was nice, it was really nice um, to have that bridge. Yeah. So it sounds like those years really were, as you say, very formative and very influential and have had a long-lasting impact on how you approach your work and your philosophies towards architecture. Yeah, and I think it's the period. The 80s um, was a very diverse period full of different architectural thought processes. Mm. I would say between the 60s to the 90s, lots of isms, historicism, deconstructivism, structuralism, and it wasn't only just school, uh, New Haven, where Yale was, was a train ride from New York City. And, and I took the train often to MoMA and all the Met for exhibitions. And I, I saw that Philip Johnson curated a deconstructivist exhibition, and I knew I didn't want to do that. Um, and then I went downstairs, there was a whole Viennese secessionist exhibition. 
and I was just intrigued by the contemporaneous of their work. You know, mm -hmm. they're bridging between classical and and actually constructivist kind of uh, details. Uh, at the same time, I was uh, also straddling between liking and not liking classical architecture. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you a story um, on my studio where uh, we went down to Robert Stern's office for a review. And it was an addition of, a, for me, a harpsichord museum, you know, to the Yale uh, Museum of Antiqui Musical Antiquities. And I had done a very modern building, partially because I ran out of time, and <laughs> <laughs> but you know, even that review I remember, it's probably one of the most devastating review, but you know, it's lessons in that. Yeah. You know, I bring all my models and came my turn in Bob Stern's office and Philip Johnson, you know. Wow. After I tried to present, there was just dead silence <laughs> and there was just one question, what, what was your historical precedent? What were you drawing upon, you know? And I was grasping for things because I said I didn't. Uh, this is a process, and I looked at Khan, Khan's museum. You look at the corners, and it was like next. Because at that moment, at that particular studio, you had to start by appropriating a part of history and then mm. tell, tell the jurors how do you learn from it? Do you distort it in a mannered way, you know, mm. the way Michelangelo had done in the Laurentian Library? But you know, what it did to me, even though it was a culture shock, was it gave me the gateway to appreciate um, architectural history, yeah. you know, and look deeper. I've done something that's out of my depth, but I remember them well. Hmm. That's really interesting. So actually, that leads me really nicely to my next question, which is um, to have you describe your approach or your philosophy to architecture or your style or aesthetic, however you would describe it. I, I mean, I've heard, I've read a few different descriptions of, of what other people suggest your work is, but I'd love to hear it from you. Yeah, the stories I told you about my, my education and understanding actually evolved into what I do. Then I worked for another class called Architect, and then uh, I came back here. This is where I came back to Asia, where my roots were. Full circle, I went to visit my birthplace again, I appreciated it, and that's it's kind of, allowed me to have an understanding because of my studies, the importance of figure ground relationships, uh, positive space, negative space, the, the great attributes of classical design, like procession, um, axes, all those to me are syntax, and syntax that need to be taught, need to be learned, which I feel today we are too process oriented. So, so we are, today we are very much conceptualized, conceptual, mm -hmm. we're very conceptual and we're image driven. Mm -hmm. But those days, there were rules and there were rules and rules are safety rails for architects, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, How does that affect me uh, in, in my approach? It gave me the security of, of language. And then I started working on small houses yeah, when I started my company in 1995, and with each small house, I try to adapt to what's happening of that time, which is regionalism, right? Kind of thing. And also, I had visited places like Bali, India. Mm. So I was trying to refer back to to something, which is very helpful, right? Mm. So I was constantly referring back to history and how does that fit in <clears throat> compared to Bramante and. Florence, so I had that, so, and it's valuable for me. And, and when I started to study the grandmasters, like, I like Mies, uh, Frank Wright, Khan, Kobu, mm. everybody likes them, mm. but I understood they too were influenced by tradition because, you know, they, they overlap the Beaux-Arts. Mm. So that, that interest in history and architecture actually resulted in me going something else that looked rather different, mm. which is something I coined neotropical because of what I did uh, in, in Singapore and Southeast Asia. And that was 
to still to still try to impart the feeling of the space I felt in a good classical building, which is uplifting, mm. right? I, I, you know, I go to the Pantheon, you're in awe, not just the scale, but the whole proportion. Yeah. So that's missing in a lot of uh, contemporary discourse because we're much more formal. Mm. Of course, I was influenced by everything else that's happening. But eventually, I think through the years, it evolved into something that was my own. So I'm, I'm curious to know whether you found some similarities. You talked about all of those, I think you said syntax, the sort of language of classical architecture, which is perhaps the procession and the axes and, and, and proportions. Did you also start to notice that in traditional Chinese architecture when you went back to Penang? Did you find any kind of similarities in the way that th those spaces had been laid out or planned? Is that something that... Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Um, uh, the palaces, um, uh, whether it's a forbidden city um, or like Ku Kong Si, um, yeah, very much so. There was a sense of always trying to create a hierarchy of outdoor rooms um, and uh, understanding uh, uh, figure ground, um, uh, just as Bramantis and Piero in Florence. Um, so the difference I felt was. There's a certain, uh, in Asian architecture, uh, in particular Japanese and, and Chinese, the construction methodology is different. There's wood and, and especially Japanese architecture, there's ephemeral quality to it, like the Imperial Palace, Katsura. So it was all these things. The thing that it did to me was the education allowed me to revisit Asian architecture, not totally uh, from an from a international standpoint of having been educated overseas. So that's why I believe in the universality of uh, architecture, you know. Mm. Because if you can understand it, then you can communicate it, right? Mm. And whether you like it or not, the Western architectural education has dominated the world. Mm. So <clears throat> when when People in Singapore were having an anti-colonial mindset about architectural history and the British. I always say we are part of it, you know, and we all are schooled in it. But it allows us to understand the precedents in Asian architecture better and then to be able to apply it to our work. Mm. Yeah, I'm always really curious about that, architects from this part of the world that have gone to study in, say, Europe or the US and then coming home and how easily you can apply a very Western education to a very different part of the world where the climate, for instance, is, you know, one of the bigger differences, obviously. Um, it's always really interesting to, to hear how architects kind of come back and practice here and how they've adapted or developed that learning and that education and applied it to a very different part of the world. But yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, so, so when and how did you eventually end up in Singapore then? Oh, I had, I had worked for a couple of people in the East Coast, like the classical actor Alan Greenberg, then KPF, Con Peasant Fox. And then I, I was, uh, it was time for me to come and reconnect, and I thought I would come back here for maybe three, four years. Understand more of architecture here and then go back. I wanted to live in the US. Um, so I applied for jobs and we, we had three offers. One was with the Planning Authority of Singapore, the URA. One was in the university to teach, which they say you have to go back and get your PhD, and one was in private practice. And I eventually chose to go into private practice I mean, after five years of designing many things that never got built. I, I believe in five years, I, I, I don't think I had anything built, but I've done so many designs on paper, competitions and stuff, mm. that finally I decided to start my own studio in 1995. So that was really the driving force for starting SCDA then? Yes, uh, the education of an architect is a long one. <clears throat> so I appreciated working with Architect 61. <clears throat> uh, they were 
they were like the local counterparts to the star architects for a lot of their projects. I am Pei, Kenzo Tange. So the company would support and administer the contract, right? Mm. But it, with each, with each um, company, you learn different things. So I learned a lot there. Mm. That really helped when I started my own practice. So you, you founded SCDA in 1995. You, this is the 25 year anniversary. Have you had a chance to celebrate that? Well, we you? had plans. We kind of missed our 20th. Mm. We said 25, so we had plans to do um, an exhibition here, traveling exhibition. We have plans to publish uh, a different kind of book that, that would explain um, the the, the thinking behind our projects because our first few books were coffee table glossy books and we wanted the paperback accompaniment that explains in a more academic way trying to break down each project into elements like circulation, axes, landscape, etc. So like um, kind of Descartes or Durand like, like a taxonomy of parts that I, I still believe this taxonomy of parts is something that I could share with architects. The rest of it they can learn, you know, mm. conceptual images and so on and so forth. But I wanted to explain that there's certain fundamentals that you need to understand. That's my belief. That's how I conduct my studio. When designers come in, I explain the work in fundamentals so that we can all communicate with the same language. Mm. Well, you've certainly accomplished quite a lot in the last 25 years. I mean, you have now built a number of projects, some of them very high profile here in Singapore and in other parts of the world, and a number of awards, and you've got three offices, if I'm not wrong, across the world, not to mention a large family. Right. <laughs> How on earth do you balance all of that? Yeah, I think, I think Architecture has been my life, and it's the constant that keeps everything together, and then uh, everything else organizes around it. Um, on the part of uh, family, um, it really wasn't a big issue um, because my wife understands, and she's also in the design field, and a lot of my kids um, are self-motivated, and they go off early to boarding schools, and overseas schools and we have a quite an international traveling lifestyle to keep up with family and friends. So my thinking a year ago that has changed a little bit was this globalization was never going to stop. Mm -hmm. And I never thought anything of getting on a plane tomorrow to go to New York and pack my bags three, four hours before and go. So Anywhere I go, if I find something beautiful, piece of land somewhere, I, I, it never occurred to me that it's so far away. Mm. And that's how we've been doing our projects too. It's all over the world. We have done projects in 70 plus locations, cities in the world, you know. So do you try to separate work and not work? Or for you, is it a very happy kind of blending all together? Is it just one big melting pot of your life? the work and the travel and... Uh, I think all blends together. Uh, my, my work as an architect and my love for hospitality, which encompasses uh, guest experience, food, wellness. I think all those are areas of interest. Uh, good wine, for example, right? Mm. Um, so happily, I, I think it kind of blends in. And there are moments where you need to cut out time for something that's not related to what you do, but most of the time I think they, they overlap. Mm. Well, I think that's a great segue because I, I want to talk about Suri now um, because I think one of the things that I find really interesting about your practice is that you are one of few architects that I've met that has now kind of created this brand where you can develop self-initiated projects. Um, did you always have ambitions to do this? Was it something in the back of your mind for a long time? Yeah, I think my early uh, education of, of uh, design as this larger universe that encompasses different things, uh, product design included, it was natural for me that hospi hospitality would come into the picture because 
when you do your own hotel, it's the vessel that allows you to put everything together, whether you're designing plates or designing a guest experience, furniture, architecture, interior, landscape. It was the chance to pull together the orchestra, you know? And, and that was, the, the, the chance came when my wife and I, in 2004, went on a holiday and um, we want to do a family home and that quickly became a hotel. Then the rest of it is really jumping in, not knowing how complicated it would be. <laughs> and then as it unfolds, you deal with each problem. Yeah. You know, uh, and that same mindset uh, of, of, of finding the right place, when the opportunity presents, take it, you know, and then worry about how to solve it later. That's been kind of what guide my work ethic and what I want to do. Okay. So what, what is coming up for Suri next that you're able to talk about now? Because I know there's a couple of yes. potential... Well, uh, the Suri brand represents to me uh, the, a lifestyle of the softer aspects of architecture, the software. So we have Suri Bali, that is the leading hotel resort, right? Then we have Suri Highline, which was a service uh, condominium with spa and some services. Uh, then, you know, I've kind of taken sites in areas where I thought it interesting, like in Niseko, which we were designed but not executed. And recently we uh, got land in Wyoming, so they're quite desperate, you know, mm. Wyoming, Niseko. Uh, so Wyoming, we have the land. And, and then I'm also now closing in, finalizing my birthplace, the Kukong Si UNESCO, I'd like to do a heritage hotel. So that, that is hopefully going to be done by first quarter and that will be my really passion project because I have a real uh, connection to my growing up and I think it's, it's a very appropriate project to come full circle. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. Well, I've never been to Penang, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very, I'm going to be very curious to see that when it does come about. Um, aside from that project, which obviously is very clear why you would want to develop that site. I mean, obviously there's a very strong emotional and family connection to that property, but I'm curious to know how, what the thought process behind selecting other land, you know, you know, where did Wyoming come about? How did that happen? Well, um, a few years ago, uh, it was very clear that, that to me it's very clear that, that, that we were quite uh, focused on luxury. And I wanted to pivot because I always knew, um, even though we did all our projects with platinum, Green Globe, Earth Check, Leeds. It, it wasn't apparent. So uh, uh, I think last year I started SEDA Lab, which is a group of my guys and myself trying to do something that's very different than SEDA. And we were pushing for uh, off grid, uh, self sustaining small dwelling. So it, we came on the idea of. Um, the container, which is quite commonly used, but in, in this case we said container should contain all the parts, solar panels, etc. in that container. Ship it, when you open the container, you assemble it, and then you have this unit that's totally off-grid, uh, you can live anywhere. So Wyoming was a test case, there was a river nearby, it's huge nature, and Really, uh, we designed it for that site. So I'm looking for sites like Wyoming or Catskills, where the opposite of Surrey, which is about food and luxury, this is still a new kind of luxury. This, this tender, as I call it, Indonesian for tents, will be, this is my goal to set, up, set them up along trails and along established beautiful places. And the reason it's designed is that because it's, it's very light on its footprint and we hope to convince the national parks to have tenders so that if you take a journey and you go, you can sleep in a tender and rethink what new luxury is today in terms of view, fresh air, activity. Mm. So I wanted to do that and then still keep Suri going 
because I think in some ways it, it will and it has influenced the way my studio design you know interesting well I think that's a nice segue actually to my final question for you I feel like I could chat all day but um, I'd, I'd love to know whether you think that you or and other architects and other designers have a responsibility to leave the planet maybe in a, as a better place than you know perhaps before we arrived yes I think architects all want to do that and but architects are also responsible for so much <laughs> contribution to ne negativity to the environment <clears throat> and I've been on quite a few of these <clears throat> webinars and I always say <clears throat> architects cannot save the world <clears throat> architects need to collaborate we are a small part of a bigger equation <clears throat> when you have a serious issue so you see like now architects come later we, we conceptualize and talk about uh, the city and the flight to the suburbs, but the engineers, for example, uh, and the scientists are trying to come up with solutions. Um, for example, in the age of cholera, sewers were improved by engineers. Um, maybe now engineers looking at ventilation systems. But what I always felt was <clears throat> architects all, we all want to, because it's very clear, but we need to look at cues of what's happening rather than always try to pontificate what it is. If you ask me, I'd say not sure. <clears throat> but I can see, for example, uh, New York City, <clears throat> uh, my friends, my kids there, <clears throat> uh, the, the sidewalks broadened, streets narrowed, <clears throat> um, people want more space to walk, dining outside, bike lanes. Some streets reduced to one to two lanes, <clears throat> and then the whole city changes, right? Mm. And that came because of restrictions and conditions and that came because it was imposed sort of unilaterally on the whole city mm. so if architects take a cue from what's happening and reinforce that cue and what we uh, workers and social workers and other professionals i think we can do better you know the kind of vision to impose on by a few people i, I don't think it's going to solve anything but I, I, I do know that all of us as architects, we want to live a better world. And, and most of us want to affiliate with green buildings. But the road to get there requires a lot of sacrifice of building less. I think that's a really very powerful message. Thank you so much. It's, um, it's been really great chatting. I wish we had more time, but uh, it's <laughs> there's never enough time. <laughs> But yeah, thank you for being on the podcast. It's, it's always thank a you. pleasure. Thank you. It's always a pleasure uh, talking to you. Um, I felt like uh, we have been having conversations for a long time, and this is a continuation of our other conversations. Yeah, it does feel a bit that way. That's right. It's really nice. Thanks, Sukian. Thank you, Susie. Yeah.